From the biggest fails that loathe and infamy to cheaters taking over the community by storm, Geometry Dash has seen a vast amount of memorable moments and controversies, but what happened if you were to change the outcome of these events? How would the game change as a result? That's what we're going to be exploring today. Geometry Dash's biggest what-if moments that could have changed the game's history as we know it. Our journey begins all the way back in the days of 2013, much before Update 1.9 revolutionized the game forever. Back then, creating a level was more simplistic, with fewer blocks and game mechanics to work with. But the first ever creator to surface in the game was one that would inspire not one, but two game modes that the game uses today. We're of course talking about the real Darnok, who in 2013 released a level onto the servers known as Gravity Field, a level that closely resembles the UFO game mode that we've become accustomed to today. It was this level that would ultimately lead to the creation of the UFO game mode in Update 1.5, but this is only the start. Several months later, in Update 1.8, Darnock would release another level that would break the game forever, this time being a level known as Wave Wave. This level consists of entirely UFO gameplay, with blue orbs that would immediately change the gravity of the player, creating this smooth motion. This level would inspire another new game mode that would be introduced to the game in Update 1.9, that being the Wave. I can't tell you how important the Wave game mode is to the top players, as it's perhaps the most popular game mode used near the top of the demon list. If Darnock never stumbled across Geometry Dash early on, then two game modes that are prevalently used today would cease to exist. Sure, there's a possibility that one or both of these game modes would have eventually been made, more likely the UFO, but neither of them would have been created at the time that they were. This in turn would have delayed or even halted the development of levels today, and demon levels, especially extreme demons, would be unrecognizable today. Like I said before, the wave game mode is used in abundance in extremely hard levels. Speaking of demons, let's talk about Demon Park real quick. Demon Park was the level that gave Raft up the inspiration to name these extremely hard levels demons. While demons are what pushed this game forward, it would be outlandish to think that wiping Demon Park off the map would just remove all demons. They'd still exist in a different form, just wouldn't be named demons. A more minor change, but one that's definitely worth talking about. Let's table the turns with our next edition, but before we do that, if you'd like what you're watching, why not subscribe to the channel? It takes one click and it helps me out a bunch. Anyway, let's go from one of the easiest demon levels to one of the hardest. This is Sonic Wave, which has been a staple on the demon list for 7 years. While its reign may be coming to an end in a matter of days, I can't believe I'm saying that. What's more fascinating is the level's verification history. As we all know today, Sonic's was the one who would eventually go on to verify the level, some months after Cyclic was exposed for originally hacking the level. However, Sonic's wasn't the first one who had attempted this. In early 2016, an unknown player by the name of Mifui would make headlines with their own progress on Sonic Wave, on a version that was even harder than the one that we know of today. With their hardest demon being Decode, they were a true underdog story, going from one of the easiest demons to the hardest that the game had to offer. Mifui had everything going for them, and had found themselves in the last 10% of the level. What happened next is a moment in history. No! Oh, 98! <laughs> <Making it. laughs> <laughs> no! No! had crashed at 98% on his own version of Sonic Wave. This would be the last that we would hear from him. There would be no completion for him, and the level would then fall into the hands of both Riot and Sonix, who both made progress on Cyclic's updated version. After a back and forth battle, Sonix would ultimately become the verifier of Sonic Wave, which would go on to be the hardest level for around a year. This is a story that's a bit harder to theorize. If Mifui had verified Sonic Wave instead of crashing at 98%, then Sonix wouldn't have had the spotlight shine on them for a longer period of time, maybe even forever. Maybe he never becomes the god that we know him as today. But with the buffed version of Sonic Wave replacing the one we have now, it becomes possible that the level would be significantly harder on the demon list than where it is today. As of writing this video, the level sits at number 148, and it's the last level on the list that wasn't verified in Update 2.1. Assuming the level is rated soon after being verified, Sonic Wave goes on a completely different journey. First, it becomes the level to officially dethrone Bloodbath from the list, whereas the original honor was in the possession of New Bass's old impossible level known as Sukup in Hell. Also assuming every level that follows Sonic Wave isn't changed in any way, it would go on to have an extremely lengthy reign on the demon list. How lengthy, you may ask? If you want my best guess, at the earliest until Plaza Pulse Finale comes around, and at the latest, Bloodlust, meaning Sonic Wave has a longer reign at the number one spot than the current record holder, being Tartarus. Considering how difficult Mifui's version of the level is, it's hard to imagine Yate Garasu going above the level for even a second after Trust's nerfs. Erebus also never sees that title, leaving the RGB's legacy in jeopardy. It robs several other levels of their number one spots too, with Sakup in Hell, Athanatos, Artificial Ascent, Stalemate Redux, and Digital Descent never reaching that spot. Not to mention, Mifiwa's legacy would change from one of infamy to one of a glorious triumph. Perhaps he goes on to have a career much like Sonic themselves, but unfortunately, all we can ask in this scenario, and every other, is what if. 
There are plenty of other notable fails that would have changed the game forever had the attempt gone differently. Examples of such include Nubble Boy's 98% fail on Bloodlust, Mosley's 97% fail on Tartarus, and Dill Stick's 98% fail on Abyss of Darkness, just to name a few. But moving away from tragic failures, we transition into a completely different side of the community. As Jam Trudash hasn't had an update in over 6 years, the game has solely relied on its community to keep the game running all this time until Roptop finally announced a release date in the Year of Our Lord 2023. At the end of 2019, there was a common belief that the update was near its much anticipated release, with the prelude animation premiering on December 14th, 2019. However, this would ultimately end up to be nothing more than false hope. Though even with the community frustrated towards the game's lack of new content from the developer, we could always rely on ourselves. However, that would have become nearly impossible if not for one of the greatest waves of content creators that the game had ever seen. In order to get yourself out there in the community, you need to stand out from the rest of the crowd, and a growing player by the name of Nepesta did exactly that, with its verification of the then number 2 level on the demon list, known as Kinos. It was this moment that gave the community a huge spark. Nepesta would become one of the best content creators that the game has ever seen, and along with his growth, several other figures would soon follow. A level of verification is given to one particular person at a time, well, most of the time at least, while he was the verifier of Kinos, that wasn't always the case. The level was originally meant to be verified by a player named Combined, the verifier of another highly coveted level in Artificial Ascent. But Combined wouldn't stick to the project, and after the level fell into a state of limbo for a bit, it eventually fell into the hands of our friend, who took the level in stride, and the rest is history. This whole period led to the growth of the game on both YouTube and Twitch, and helped to keep the game at consistent numbers, even reaching records in 2022, over half a decade after the last new content was introduced. Though if Combined stuck out his original version of Kinos and verified the level, then everything I just talked about would have been highly jeopardized as a result. If Combined verified Kinos instead of Nepesta, the YouTube landscape of Geometry Josh would be completely different, and unrecognizable today. Live streaming of the game would not be developed nearly as much, as the game struggles to reach out to a wider audience. While it's true that some other level verifications have gained more views than Nepesta's Kinos verification, it's safe to say that his completion did the best job of reaching a wider audience given the circumstances. But nevertheless, this is a very important completion, and one that almost didn't happen in its entirety. Our next area of interest is one that hasn't really been brought to light, and to do that, I'm going to show you a clip from our good friend himself. I think one of the main things people haven't been talking about is like if Rob continued to not rate extremes he didn't like. He only rated like one extreme every like month and it was usually an easy extreme for like most of 2018. Crimson Planet didn't get rated, a lot of other hard levels didn't get rated just because he didn't feel like it. If he continued to act like that then people would have had to have some level of quality and the top levels we see now would be entirely different. So Cuban Circles would not have been rated. A lot a lot of levels at the top simply would not have been, like Avernus wouldn't have been rated, these levels would not have been rated. And people would still make hard levels, but they'd be very different quality. The creating community would be greatly impacted. If their levels weren't being recognized with rates, then why is there a reason to keep playing? We'd lose lots of rated levels, but we'd also lose talented creators in the process. Dropping the active player base in the community, essentially creating a domino effect that would lead to the gradual decline of the game in its entirety. While some have criticized the mod team for their rating standards over the years, in the end, it all comes down to Robstop's decision on whether or not to rate a level. And him opening up to levels that he doesn't necessarily like is very nice to see, and leaves the door open for hundreds of creators to potentially have a shot at a rated level of their own. While the demon list is driven off of level rates, the players that complete them equally push this game forward, but in a community that's competing for the top spot, you're certainly going to get some bad actors. Unfortunately, we've had players cheat their way to the top of the ranks several times, taking fame from other legitimate players who actually deserve the spotlight. There have been many big scandals, from Andromeda to Cyclic to Noctifly, but without a doubt, the biggest hacking scandal the game has ever seen occurred only this year. Y'all know who I'm talking about, Space UK. Before his expulsion, he was widely regarded as the best player of his time, and for some, the best player of all time. So when his exposal saw the light of day, everything went to shit. Not only was the Slaughterhouse verification hacked, but he had stolen the spotlight from at least half a dozen other players that would have achieved higher praise if he was caught. And believe it or not, he was very close to being caught early on. A little while ago, I made a video about Space UK claiming that he had fooled everyone. Little did I know, that wasn't entirely true. One person knew what was going on, but unfortunately, their cries for help fell on deaf ears. A user by the name of Kolo had correctly identified the method that Space UK was using to cheat before he even verified Slaughterhouse. But unfortunately, the claims were thought to have been outlandish by the majority of the community. For the next year and a half, Space UK would continue to cheat at the top of the mountain, before his exposal came and went. While we already have a very good idea of what would have happened if Space UK was caught back in the day, something I'd like to bring to light is the opposite side of the coin. What if Space UK was never exposed as a cheater? How long would he have gone on for? 